So welcome to this week's topics and tech series, uh, which is a weekly series of uh, Bentley alumni and other good friends of ours who come and tell us what they're doing in the world of technology. This program is also Bentley Plus certified, so if you're part of that program, you can use it to toward that certificate. And there's information about that online. And we'll be giving everybody a quick survey at the end of this presentation as well. So uh, please take that. I'll put it up on the screen when we're done. Gavin Bauman, what I met, we were talking about this earlier. He used to be a technology evangelist at Microsoft, and he came here to the sandbox many times to show us how to make computer games. And we've been in touch ever since, and now he is doing cool stuff as a lead engineer for a company called Stately.ai. He's going to tell the story of how to do tech professionally. So Gavin, take it away. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of me. Um, when I met Mark, I was working um, for a little company. It was a startup uh, by the name of Microsoft. You might have heard of them. I don't know if they're in the news yet. Um, but uh, yes, I worked as a technical evangelist back then. Um, and we did. We did um, sessions every semester for, uh, gosh, maybe four semesters concurrently on uh, intro to game dev using an engine called Construct 2. It was um, a lot of fun. There was a lot of pizza. Um, I, I still blame a good seven pounds um, of my current body weight for the year 2015 at Bentley. Um, but yeah, so that's not what this is about, though. This is about sort of um, uh, how to break into the the, the tech uh, sector as far as careers go. Uh, I, w I really wanted to cover some things that I wish I had known earlier on in my career. Um, and I also wanted to like give so sort of the the lofty, airy, theoretical pros and cons and things you should and shouldn't do. And then I wanted to um, split the talk, sort of pivot halfway and transition to actual concrete, you can go do this today, it'll help your career out tomorrow sort of thing. So I hope y'all find this useful. Um, I also want to say one quick thing, something I notice a lot with students, especially freshmen, yes, I'm profiling, is that um, whenever someone comes and does a talk, uh, a lot of folks feel that they can't reach out for whatever reason. And I want to be very clear. I've heard this from, you know, folks at Harvard. I've heard it from, you know, um, the BU folks, the MIT folks. But I'm, I want to be clear, if anyone puts their contact information on a PowerPoint presentation, that means you can reach out. So if there's anything you might need from me, feel free to email me, um, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I respond to all of those platforms. I did not put my email there. Well, feel free to hit me up on Twitter <laughs> or uh, LinkedIn. Um, I will definitely respond. So that's sort of like the elevator pitch for what this session is. Uh, we can go ahead and get started. I'm just going to go and hit start here. And just to be sure, everybody can see the um, the the PowerPoint up and going. Not sharing your screen yet. I am not sharing my screen. You, you see, that might help. Uh, let's go ahead and get that going. I could have sworn I hit that button. All right, how about now? Yep. All right, sick. So, um, <clears throat> well. Shoot, I wish I had that backdrop 30 seconds ago. But anyway, yes, yeah, so I am a lead software engineer at a small startup uh, called Stately Software. You can get to us by going to stately.ai. Uh, what the company is essentially is it's a company built around building dev tools by devs for devs. So the idea is to simplify the development of application logic by thinking about your app logic in terms of states. So instead of having a bunch of like really, um, I'm going to say really uh, cautious error handling or spaghetti code, you can, you know, with a bunch of if else clauses, you can have a series of states that only lead to other states through these um, very specific prescribed uh, transitions uh, governed by events and actions, and it all falls under this spec called state charts, which is a concept that's existed since the 80s. It's tried and true. There's just been no real implementation of it across the board. So that's what we're doing here at Stately. Mm -hmm. There's currently already a, a front end component. So you can go to stately.ai and you can uh, check out the front end component, the editor and things of that nature. I am not a front end developer. I focus primarily on the back end. So we're actually building out the back end infrastructure and I get to own all of that, which I'm very excited about. So 
Uh, very, very exciting things coming down the pike. I'd appreciate it if y'all checked it out. It'd be really cool if you did. Um, and other than that, on the side, I am also the founder uh, of my own uh, company called uh, Bionic Panda. And I am a, uh, we are rather a software consulting firm. I'm currently working on a project with the University of Virginia, a uh, couple of physicians there on an app called Tremor Trainer. It'll be an open source app, so anyone can pull it down, modify the source code or vet whether or not, you know, it's, it's, it's up to snuff and submit code fixes and bug fixes and things of that nature. It, the app is focused around providing therapy for folks suffering from functional tremors. And what a functional tremor is, for those who may not know, is um, a tremor imposed purely by um, stressors and anxiety causes. So I always say, if you want a really good dramatic example, you know, you've maybe you've watched a crime drama or an action movie where someone who's never pulled a gun before pulls a trigger and accidentally kills someone and their hands are shaking like that, you know, because they're super stressed out. Um, but in the real world, it turns out that these tremors manifest through means of um, long-term stressors over time. So um, a good, uh, well, not good, but um, a prominent example is um, women who have been in uh, very long uh, uh, domestic abuse situations. Um, and once they're out of it, things may seem fine and they may feel fine, but their brain is still in fight or flight mode and hasn't transitioned yet. And so out of nowhere in the middle of tea or just checking your phone, their hands may twitch um, or start shaking uncontrollably. And so uh, there's been some really promising research around how to offer therapy for it. And um, we're turning that research into a mobile app that anyone can use it at home at their leisure without having to um, go to the doctor every time they need to go through a session. So um, that's currently what I'm working on. It's very exciting. Uh, and again, feel free to take down my contact info and reach out if uh, ever you feel you need to, if this talk goes well. So I'm gonna go ahead and progress through the slide. Um, I said I'd introduce myself. Um, I said I'd go pretty deep into who I am, uh, where I came from, and this is just that. Um, so off to the left is a picture of my face. I promise that's me. Um, and to the left of that is my puppy. So that's Lucy. I've had her, uh, got her in Boston as a rescue. As a matter of fact, in 2015, um, she's mostly a border collie and we don't know what else, but she's both too short and too long to be a full breed. So who knows? So anyway, uh, I'm currently a software engineer at Stately, but before that I worked at Microsoft for nearly eight years, around seven and a half years on the dot. I started my career at Microsoft as a technical evangelist in 2014, where I met Mark and a bunch of other faculty at, um, at Bentley and several other universities. At the time I was living in Boston, I owned the Northeast uh, District as a whole, and I would go and do several technical presentations there. Um, after that, I transitioned to a core software engineering role with uh, an org on a team called uh, CSE, which is Commercial Software Engineering. I did that for four years. Um, coming from Boston down to Atlanta. It's a lot of fun there. I am born, raised, and schooled in New Orleans, Louisiana. You might catch my accent. I'm told that I don't really have a thick one, but when I'm mad, it comes out. And uh, uh, for those that may not have been in the room when I said it, um, having lived in Boston for four and a half years, I really want to say this. It's very important. You don't have to do these winters. There are other options. You can leave. There are places where the, you, know, you don't have to shovel your car out of the snow. I'm just saying, um, I no longer have to put on seven layers and then get to the subway and then take six of the layers off. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, so <clears throat> finally, I'm a big gamer. Uh, love uh, playing video games. It's kind of been like, you know, a lifelong, I don't want to call it a passion, more like a vice. I'll play, uh, I'm a big fighting gamer, big shooter. Um, and recently, just recently, I've been getting into narrative games. So playing games for fun and not stress anymore. That's what I always call it. All right, so to dive a little bit deeper into my career, uh, usually when I tell folks that I was or am a technical evangelist, no one has any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it's always good to explain it. It's always good to cover it. So a tech evangelist is essentially a geek that speaks, um, a good synonym for it right now. And I think this is a more industry specific role now is a, a developer advocate. Um, we have those at Microsoft. Uh, they're called CDAs now, Cloud Developer Advocates. So if you're looking into that role, that's what you'd be looking for primarily now. But at the time, they were called technical evangelists. And by day, we would you know, code up different ways to 
build X on Y technology. So whatever company you work for, your job as a technical evangelist, you sit between software engineering and marketing and um, maybe a little bit of sales sometimes, although you never actually sell anything, but the sales org usually calls on to, to have you do things. And you're also a little bit of customer support. So you're, you're, you're wearing a lot of hats depending on what the need calls for. Primarily what my, my responsibilities were was I owned the student startup and indie, I'll say independent developer, so ISV, smaller companies um, in New England. So everywhere from Bentley University all the way up to um, Cornell, um, all the way down to, I, I think I think the most south I went was Philly at the time um, for schools. So we would sponsor hackathons where uh, we would offer prizes for the teams that did the coolest thing using Microsoft Tech. I would be there as a technical resource, walking students through how to use our APIs, how to actually build out what they were seeking to build. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we would do uh, technical presentations at local developer meetups, um, as well as tech conferences. Now for conferences, they're usually national or international even. So I traveled quite a bit around the country for that and sometimes out of the country. Uh, I think my largest crowd was 450 people. I'm very proud of that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of conferences, if you look at that picture on the right, that guy, that guy's a little familiar. Um, I, Mark, I don't remember this conference at all, but I saw the picture. I have no idea what we talked about there. Um, the oh. Campus Technology Conference in 2015. We must have talked about games. Sure. <laughs> Let's say yes. Um, I, I think I may have blacked out that day. I have no, I have no recollection of it. I was just going through my pictures. I, forgot, and I was like, oh my goodness. I forgot we did that. I know, right? Um, so that's pretty much um, what my responsibilities were as a technical evangelist. Uh, and my job as a software engineer is much more uh, straightforward. It um, At Microsoft, my job as a software engineer was to work with uh, larger enterprises to pretty much solve the problems that they weren't able to solve before. And many of them were problems that have not been solved in industry at all. So I got to see literally the bleeding edge sometimes of our tech and built in some of it um, for customers. We would sit with them between six and nine months, build out a solution, um, hand it off for them to bring to you know full on production and any feedback um, that we got or any bugs that we noticed, we would you know either fix them if we were already in a space where we could, but if the, if the code was closed source, we would turn to the product teams, um, submit issues to them, tell them to fix it because it was blocking us. And sometimes we would work with them and get access to their code base and uh, build in solutions. So a lot of fun, uh, a lot of different projects. Uh, speaking of which, um, I have several projects that I wanted to call out, some of my favorite ones. By the way, y'all, I'm going to be extremely clear. Um, there are very few slides here from this point on without a GIF in them. So if you're anti-GIF, you can just walk out the room. I think I might trigger you, but um, I don't know anyone. I've never met anyone who's anti-GIF yet. So I think I hope we're OK. Uh, so yeah, some of my favorite projects so far. Uh, the first one is called Platform Chaos. Um, that was uh, a lot of fun. It was implementing chaos engineering as a concept on the Microsoft Cloud, which is called Azure. Uh, does anybody know what chaos engineering is by chance? I'll take resounding silence as a no. Well, that, that's great because I don't need to know a lot to impress you. Um, so chaos engineering is actually a coin, a term coined by Netflix. Uh, Netflix operates at such an immense scale that you would not believe. And fault tolerance and the ability to recover quickly is extremely important for them. So if a machine goes down or if AWS, Amazon Web Services, Amazon's cloud, if Amazon's cloud goes down for whatever reason in a region, they need to be able to self-heal very quickly um, and retarget all of their load, us, all of the customers watching um, uh, and interacting with their services over to another region. So chaos engineering is this concept of intentionally injecting faults into a running system, a live system. So intentionally breaking things to see how the overall system recovers. And so we got to build a, a smaller version of that um, for Azure, for anyone using Azure the platform as a service or pass offerings. Um, very exciting stuff. So up next is like Kroger inventory management system. Uh, Kroger had a problem with um, uh, 
moving some of their legacy code that actually tracked what, what was bought, what was sold, in what district was it bought, in what district was it sold, all of that good stuff. It took them hours to generate a report so that executives could see what was going on or even both for executives so managers could see what they could even order. So we completely re-architected, rebuilt and redeployed their management system and got the reporting time down from several hours to several seconds, very exciting. Um, uh, up next is the Tremor Trainer app, which I talked about earlier with University of Virginia. That's just an app that's going to help a lot of people out. It's very exciting, making sure that folks um, suffering from functional tremors have an actual way to um, you know, provide therapy to themselves without having to go into a doctor um, to actually sit and run through the exercises. Because there are exercises with the use of a metronome and um, an accelerometer and a gyroscope um, that can be done. But right now, there's no modality, no treatment modality outside of going to a very specific doctor who's done research on this, um, scheduling a time with him to do an exercise you functionally have to do every day. So clearly the way it's done right now isn't scalable, but everybody's got a smartphone. So that's what we're building there. Um, and the, the last one I want to talk about, actually, I'm going to skip two of them. But the last one I want to talk about is Urban Refuge, which is the second to last bullet point. That was actually a project we did with Boston University. Um, that I'm very proud of because it, uh, it was the first project that taught me, hey man, code can actually help people. You can actually make a little, a dent in this, um, in this uh, nightmare roller coaster we call a planet. So <clears throat> Urban Refuge was focused around uh, Syrian refugees uh, that were forcibly relocated to Amman, Jordan. There were a lot of uh, barriers to keep them from seeking um, uh, uh, relief funding that was available to them. So there was a big problem with relief options being available, anything in the realms of educational to financial, to housing, to food, there was assistance available, there were resources available, but folks either didn't know about it because there was a language gap or worse, potentially worse, there's a, a social stigma attached to being a refugee and folks didn't wanna out themselves um, because there's a lot of ramifications that come as a result of that. So Urban Refuge was uh, a mobile app, again, an Android app that allowed um, folks to just pull up the app on their phone, see where they could get help and just uh, geographically locate themselves there, just direct themselves there using uh, Google Maps or uh, ways. So very, very excited about that. It's one of my favorite projects. Um, I worked on the localization aspect of that. So translating English to, um, goodness, I forgot the language they speak. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but supporting multiple languages within the app um, was uh, what I worked on. So very exciting. Um, <clears throat> so uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and I think I kind of put the cart in front of the horse when I asked for introductions and everything. I wanted to so, panel this talk, sort of make it dynamic based on who I was talking to. So uh, this is what this slide is about. Tell me about yourself. Who am I speaking with? But I've got an idea that I'm talking to a lot of freshmen. Um, so folks pretty early on in their academic careers, congratulations on landing it at Bentley, by the way, you're winning in the game. Um, and I'm noticing that I'm um, I know we have one CIS major. Is everyone else a CIS major? Or does anybody want to yell out what they're, what they're majoring in? I'm a CIS major. Woo! <laughs> anybody not? No That's one said. That's a hard question, people. <laughs> I'm in finance. Finance, okay. That's a good one. Um, I'm undecided right now. Undecided, fantastic. I'm going to tell you why that's a superpower in a few. Um, anyone I'm else? I'm finance and accounting major. Finance and accounting. Okay. Um, and is that Mike who said that? Yes. Okay. Mike, you're training to be a boring person is what I'm hearing. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, financing and accounting. You can rarely go wrong <laughs> with majoring in, uh, <laughs> with majoring in those disciplines. So uh, congrats on that, y'all. Thank you. Um, and undecided. I like that a lot because I'm going to speak to that. So um, <clears throat> the first thing I wanted to talk to y'all about is working in tech in general and just how great it is, right? So I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, when I started school, uh, this was not what I majored in originally. I ended up graduating with a computer science degree, um, but I started as a chemistry pre-pharmacy major, so way off. 
Um, I knew that I had a mind for math and science. I knew that I enjoyed making things. I saw a pharmacist come and speak in my high school, um, saw that it was, you know, relatively straightforward work. I was like, yeah, let's do that. Um, originally, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon um, uh, because I just thought it was cool. And, you know, Ben Carson was a big thing back then. It was before he went into politics and, you know, um, jaded a lot of people. But at the time, he was like, he had a movie. Most Deaf, the rapper, was in the movie playing Ben Carson. Y'all, it was everything. As a Black kid growing up, that was everything. So um, it, um, I just knew I wanted to do neurosurgery, but um, as a senior in high school, I cut my thumb, saw my own blood and passed out. So I figured neurosurgery was probably off the table. Didn't even hurt y'all, I just hit the floor. I pay, like when I see blood, I'm just the most useless person on the face of the earth. Um, so don't bleed around me is what I'm saying. Anyway, I transitioned to pharmacy, thinking that was a good next best thing. And I hated it, I hated it every day of it. Uh, the chemistry wasn't the problem. It was just this, the application of it, the lectures were insane, boring to me, like it just didn't click. Um, and on a whim, at the end of my sophomore year, uh, second semester sophomore year, I took a computer science class. Now, for context, y'all, I'd always been a techie. I'd always been kind of a nerd. Uh, you know, MySpace HTML stuff in high school. That's how old I am, by the way. Uh, MySpace HTML stuff back in high school. I played around with Flash. I loved phones. I loved phone tech a lot, but I never saw that as a viable career opp opportunity at all. It just didn't strike me as an option. Um, and uh, it's, I think the cause of that was purely because it just, there wasn't a lot of, um, of folks that I knew that worked in tech. I just didn't see it. So <clears throat> I took it literally coin toss on a whim, fell in love with it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like adult Legos. You know, you're putting things together, you're using logic, a lot of reasoning, it's a lot of fun. So um, when, I, when I realized that this is something I like to do, I, I looked and it was like, well, what's the average salary for somebody working in tech? And then I saw what it was. I was like, this is what a pharmacist makes, I'm out. Um, so I just like completely dipped out. But the trade-off there was, I was at the end of my sophomore year when I completely shifted majors. Um, I'd done most of my core curriculum, but not all of it. Most of my credits belong to chemistry and biology. Um, I, uh, you know, we, we, we weren't rich us, and there was only money in the budget for four years. I couldn't go a fifth. So I doubled up all my hours, uh, took summer classes, did 21 hours every semester until I graduated. I do not recommend that. Um, so if anyone as a freshman is listening to me, anyone as a junior is listening to me, one out of 10, do not recommend, <laughs> not a fun thing to do. I feel like some of my gray hairs I got at 20 um, for that reason. So for the, uh, the woman who said she was undecided, um, I wanted to let you know that, that that is a great, if you don't know yet, it is okay that you don't know. Honestly, explore things, take classes that, you know, you, you know, you think might be a fit, you know, sort of explore, figure out what it is that you want to do before going in like wholesale. I think that's a great move. Um, and I wish I would have done that. <laughs> so um, wanted to call you out there. Um, that is awesome. And um, you're already learning from my mistakes without even having met me, which is insane, honestly. It seems like you've also mastered time travel. Um, cool. So, um, uh, but other than that, uh, transitioning to tech, getting the gig at Microsoft was a huge break. Um, you know, uh, working in software right now um, is, a, both a lot of fun because you're solving some very real world problems and be, um, you know, uh, financially uh, stable, right? Like you can make a, a pretty good living here, which is why I'm using that awesome gift right there, um, uh, working in tech, which is also great. And I have here my comments for um, this slide. My biggest professional regret is not having more haters so I could rub this, rub my success uh, in their faces for. So that is, that's a, a joke, I guess, um, that I wrote in a fever dream when drafting this. So um, wanted to throw that out there. Tech is great. Um, but how do you do it? How do you make it? How do you like break into the industry, especially for somebody who doesn't have like a traditionally tech background, right? Um, uh, just to be very clear, while it is, you know, a lucrative industry to get into, um, and I find it to be a lot of fun, it's not perfect. A lot of the um, a lot of the uh, longstanding cultural and social issues that you find in the rest of the world are sort of um, are, are sort of echoed 
in tech as well. You know, all of our problems also exist here. Um, and I also want to note that, um, you know, it's not particularly easy uh, getting in, but it's definitely doable. So um, as far as problems go, I do want to cover things like any professional career you're getting into as a minority, tech is sort of like the, it's sort of like an exacerbation of that, right? There are not very many minorities in tech. There are not very many women in software engineering. Um, it's getting better every day um, from people that are already here. I want to be one of those people that inspire other folks that are not typically represented here to get in here um, for several reasons. The first being that very selfishly, I'm tired of being the only chocolate chip in a vanilla cake. Um, that is just a fact. So it'd be very nice to have other people that look like me more often. Uh, not so selfishly though. It is important when you're building, designing and deploying software to understand the needs of the groups that you are attempting to address. And it is very hard to do that when you're building a product for someone else that has a different background than you. So in, uh, in, in developing software, it's great to have a voice from different backgrounds or a series of voices, excuse me, from different backgrounds that allow you to build a solution that's more holistic and more robust and allows you to address what I would consider an edge case. But the fact of the matter is, it may not be an edge case. It may be an entire populace that I just don't have any perspective on. There are several instances of, I believe the first YouTube app, there's actually a white paper written on it about how it was terrible to use for people who were left-handed um, for iOS. That is something that they would have caught had someone who was left-handed been there, which I'm not saying that being left-handed is being diverse. I'm just using that as an example. For instance, like uh, African-Americans use Twitter fundamentally different uh, on average than um, our white counterparts do, you know, and understanding those needs allows you to build towards those needs. And it addresses everything from okay, I'm from a different background, but there's also this notion of accessibility, right? Uh, one cool thing about working at Microsoft is that there was an entire team devoted to accessibility and building options into software with uh, people who you know, are developmentally disabled um, in one way, shape or another, um, uh, building with those people in mind. So that's what I, why, why I wanted to call that out. <laughs> so. <clears throat> It's great, we need more people. Um, even if you feel like you represent the status quo, you know, if, you, if you're just a you know, hashtag white guy out here, that's also great because the fact of the matter is we have more roles available than people to fill them. So please <laughs> consider a career in tech. Um, but I also wanna call out that you don't just have to be a software engineer to get a role in tech. There's plenty of opportunity out there. Um, even for Mike, the finance guy, there's plenty of opportunity out there. Um, I promise you, Mike, you can, you can change this. You can write this ship. Um, so I would recommend that anyone, especially the freshmen, while you have this opportunity very early on in your college careers to be curious, go and um, try a little bit of everything, both internally in your school and externally, right outside, see what the opportunities are. One of the biggest benefits about Boston, uh, as opposed to my hometown, I love New Orleans, but Boston is the city for professional development. <laughs> it is insanely great. Um, you will throw a rock and hit a professional doing something that you wanna do, it's crazy. So take advantage of that, um, especially the folks that are uh, visiting in that are um, transfer students, definitely get out of, um, uh, sorry, Mark, I'm not trying to be rude, but get off of Bentley's campus, get out of Waltham, go into the city proper um, and you know meet folks within reasonable you know, safety issues, understanding that COVID is a thing. Um, and you can, if you're not comfortable with that, you can also do it virtually. And I'll, I'll walk through some places that you can go. But for now, I do want to cover potential career opportunities that are uh, in tech that you might not think about. Most people tend to think about software engineering, but um, there is an entire um, world of roles, right? There's technical sales, which um, if, you're, if you're in it for the cash, that's where the money is. Um, technical sales is huge. So if you find yourself being a really personable person, you really enjoy uh, selling and the, the potential upside from making commission and things of that nature, 
definitely consider selling software or selling hardware. Um, there's also software engineering, which is where I work in. There's also hardware and electrical engineering. If you're more interested about, um, if you're more interested in, you know, the 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 down to the circuit board set of problems. There is also program and project management. At Microsoft, we call them program managers. Um, and, and that translates to a project manager in most other tech companies. Uh, the reason I'm making that distinction is because program management outside of tech has a completely different set of connotations and meetings. But the industry specific term is project management. And those are folks that uh, own the project, but not any people, meaning they work between the engineering managers, the engineering team, and users to ensure that, hey, these features that we're working on are actually features that the users need. Hey, these users are complaining about not having X. Is that really their problem? Or is it their problem that, you know, they don't know that Y exists? You know, stuff like that. Being able to uh, take in user feedback, whittle that down into actionable, solvable problems, handing that off to the engineering team, building in reasonable uh, go-live dates and things of that nature and seeing a project from beginning to end um, uh, from a 500 foot view, as opposed to being in the weeds, writing the software every day. Um, PMs are extremely important. They're extremely vital. They are um, sort of split between two farms. There's BPMs and TPMs, typically. Your BPM is your business project manager and your TPMs are technical project managers. Uh, the BPMs are, you know, if you're someone with an accounting background, with a finance background, um, and you need to make sure that you can see a project from the beginning to end in terms of, well, can we fund this? And if we can fund this, what does our runway look like? How long do we have to devote to this project? Um, and how does this fit into the broader business? Uh, that's what a business PM is for. And a TPM is more around, okay, these are our core needs that we need to address. These are the things that need to be solved. This is a document that I've drafted on how to build this thing. So it's very close to technical evangelism in that respect. You're not working on the project, but you're working with the project from a technical perspective. Um, so there is that on the PM side. There's also UI and UX designers. If you're more creatively minded than me, one of my biggest regrets in life is that I'm not um, artistically inclined at all. If I was, y'all, I would be a fool out here, but I can make... I can make magic happen with data, but I cannot make a button look pretty to save my life. It's terrible. Um, so there's front end design and development for that. There's also, if you're more math inclined, um, there's ML and AI specialists, which are not traditionally developers. A lot of people mistake machine learning uh, professionals with software developers, and that's not true. They're more math oriented. They have a more traditional math background. And um, at that rate, you're looking into, you know, masters and uh, PhD level uh, education. And finally, there's business analysts. Um, these are just a few uh, suggestions, but there's business analysts, folks that look at data coming in from users, coming in from consumers, or data that's being sucked in from different systems they have, right? So a good example of that would be uh, Rolls-Royce. Uh, actually, does anybody know how Rolls-Royce makes money? By chance? I think they, they own airplanes or Make airplane engines or something like that. Nailed it. There you go. Yes. Airplane engines. They make money not even on selling the airplane engines. They rent them for literal cycles to the Boeings of the world and, you know, insert airline carrier here. Um, one of Boeing's biggest problems back in the day, they've largely solved this problem now. One of their biggest problems is knowing when their engines uh, hit their end of life series. So they slapped a bunch of sensors on them, sucked those sensors. Um, sucked the data out of those sensors, kept it in a large database, and they were able to determine that over time, their engine's length life uh, span was X number of years with these components going out first, right? So they're able to predictively, uh, predictably, excuse me, understand what's going to break and when, and so they can build better service timelines in between them. And that's the job of a business analyst, looking at that data and crafting uh, actionable insights uh, based on it. Um, so how do you get started <clears throat> if you wanted to get into any one of these roles? Um, this is going to be some general advice uh, from the lens of somebody who works in software. It's going to be general advice for pretty much any career, though. Um, and the first thing is to find your community. Find people who are extremely excited about what you do and what you, or what you want to do, what you want to work on. 
Um, I got my job at Microsoft because I'm a NSBE member. I'm a member of uh, the National Society of Black Engineers. We had a conference, a convention at the end of the year um, where there was a big job fair. We flew out to Nashville. I took my resume with me, uh, like 150 copies of my resume with me. And I just threw it out to anybody who'd look and listen. Um, I would recommend for any, um, anyone looking to get a career in tech is to find that organizational body that um, works just for both professionally and academically uh, in your lane. So for women, there's the Grace Hopper Conference, which is huge. Um, for uh, anyone, there's IEEE, I -E -E, um, and there's ACM, the, Ameri the Association for Computational Machinery, if you were into um, software. Uh, outside of that, there's also meetup.com. Um, I love meetup. Uh, meetup.com is great. I've spoken at several of them. Uh, it is a great place to meet people from literally all walks of their professional life. So that's everyone from students to people who've been doing it for 30 years. Um, the latter of which, by the way, love, love to talk about what they do. So if you wanted to see, okay, what are the tales from the trenches? What can go wrong? What works and what doesn't? You know, you can find that person, that gray beard, <laughs> essentially sitting in meetup. And I listed a couple of places that I really liked when I lived in Boston. So if you're into if you're into code, Boston Code Camp is a great place to go. It's a one day um, in. It is technically in Cambridge. It's right across the Charles River. Um, yeah, technically in Cambridge at the. I believe it's still at the Microsoft office, but don't hold me on that. Um, it is a great place to go to learn some new technical skills and meet some people and network and get to know folks, um, at which I'll be talking about networking in a minute. Uh, actually, no, I'll just talk about it now. So when I say networking, I do mean interacting with um, exchanging ideals, exchanging contact information with a lot of people. The world is built around networking. However, I think anybody who's going out there with the intent to network for the sake of networking is doing it wrong. Uh, if you're meeting folks, just to meet them and you don't really have anything of value to offer them and they don't really have any value to offer you and you're just trying to see what you can get out of it's in my opinion a huge waste of time but if you share a common interest if you have a you know a common understanding hey we're both here because you know um we are finance nerds right we are all about it mm, i love excel spreadsheets um if you're if you're into that then that is that's common ground you can talk about that you can learn from each other and you can become more entrenched and that to me has always felt more natural than just you know giving my business card out to folks because YOLO. Um, so anyway, yeah, so Boston Code Camp is one of them. There's also the Google Developers Group. So anybody looking to build a mobile app on Android or something like that, or to build something against Google services or to understand what Google offers in the way of like AdSense or SEO and stuff like that. Uh, the Google Developers Group is great to check out. Uh, there's also the Roxbury Innovation Center, which is uh, obviously in Roxbury. Uh, they have a lot of workshops around uh, just literally level 100 content, getting started with things around IoT, uh, machine learning, um, and even events for kids. And finally, there's the Microsoft Nerd Office, uh, which is the New England Research and Development Office. That's my old stomping ground. Um, I love it there. They have, um, I was going to say events weekly, and I don't think that's true. They used to have events daily. So once things, you know, COVID restrictions start to ease up a little bit, um, you may be able to head on in there and check out that space. Failing all that, a lot of this content is also offered virtually through meetup.com. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, sorry, did anybody have a question? I'm feel free to stop me while I'm rolling, by the way. Anybody have something they wanted to ask? All right, I'm gonna keep on keeping on. <clears throat> so another thing I want to talk about is the way to find your path in tech in general is not necessarily linear. I have a more traditional background, even though I did definitely change my major uh, twice. Um, um, I did have a more traditional background because I did finish with a, com with a comp sci degree, but uh, I wanted to call out folks that don't have that background. For starters, it is absolutely never, ever, ever too late to learn how to code. A lot of people feel that way. That is not true. I would encourage everyone in that room, even if your major is not CS or CIS, to try to learn a programming language because it'll help you understand um, both 
some, some general good skills, like how to break a problem down into smaller problems really well. And also, if you find yourself working with developers, you can understand the types of problems that they face. And that helps you communicate with them better and understand your role as it relates to their role a bit better. Uh, uh, and another thing I want to call out is folks coming from more diverse backgrounds oftentimes have more to offer than somebody with a traditional background. You'll see a lot of overlap between computer science and music. Uh, you'll see a lot of overlap, weirdly enough, between computer science and psychology. Um, and that background allows for a better understanding of users at the end of the day. If you're building something that end users have to use or touch, um, having like, like a psychology background had a huge impact on uh, my coworkers' understanding of what the user experience should look like and what colors to use based on what industry you're building the app for. Stuff I have absolutely no uh, experience in and shouldn't be trusted to work on. So I wanted to call that out. And finally, uh, the cool thing about tech is that um, you don't have to be, you don't have to be in college to, to get a career in it. You do not have to have a degree to get your start as a software engineer or even as a PM. Um, so uh, Mark, heed my words, everyone in, the, in that room right now, just, um, hey, save the money, just quit school, it's fine. Um, no, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Um, but uh, I do want to call out that a lot of my uh, coworkers, some of the best engineers I've ever known, are folks that, you know, have just finished high school or are college dropouts or coming from a, a boot camp program, which is a nine to 16 week intensive um, to learn the basics of software development or the basics of UI UX or the basic of data analysis. Um, so I wanted to call that out there and say, uh, even uh, for the CIS major that's a junior in the room, you're already in CIS, so you probably don't need to do this. But if you were an accounting major or something like that, you could still take that class, right? Take that extra class in, in um, SQL or something like that, um, that would allow you to give to get that, an understanding of what, what engineers go through, what needs to be built in order to have a system that um, can solve real world problems. All right, so now um, where I wanted to take this talk is from somebody who's been in career for about, I've been working professionally for about nine years now, um, uh, straight out of college. I graduated in 2014, came straight to Microsoft, did two jobs at Microsoft, transitioned this year to Stately. Uh, and I've learned a lot. There's a lot I wish I knew. Uh, and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna preface this with, you know, I hate, using um, quotes and like uh, those, uh, those, those really airy, um, you know, turns of phrases that you see on Instagram and stuff like that, because it always seems so trite. But a lot of it, it turns out, is rooted in truisms, right? And internalizing it and understanding it early is something that I wish I would have done. Um, so number one, my biggest challenge, uh, period, is uh, this little thing called imposter syndrome. Uh, it is a real thing. Am I alone in this? Or has anybody ever felt like, um, you know, they're the only one in the room that has no idea what they're doing? Oh, sweet. I see hands. Sweet. Um, so uh, the good news is that it can be dealt with. The bad news is that it doesn't go away. Uh, you always feel like that. I have worked at Microsoft um, for eight years. I've gotten several awards and accolades while I've been there. Um, I still feel as incompetent <laughs> um, as the day I came out of college. I, that's just how I feel and I have to deal with that, right? Um, but I, I, want, I wanted to like cover this and I wanted to talk about this because it is a very real problem and it has what I've learned over the years. It has a very real cost associated to it. So when you let things like that um, you know, sort of uh, envelop the way that you think and the way that you understand. Once you find a, a role that you're relatively comfortable in, it makes it really hard to leave, right? It makes it really hard to, to try that next thing because you feel like, oh, they just haven't figured out that I'm, I'm an idiot and the next person will. So, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang here for a while and, um, and maybe I can eke out an existence and it'll be okay. But um, that lack of confidence in your own ability really does hinder your potential career trajectory. It keeps you from trying new things. So when I transitioned from technical evangelism to software engineering, I went through one interview um, and uh, it went well. Um, I did not feel like it went well, but it went relatively well, good enough for them to, to hire me. That, not enough for me, not enough. I'm like, well, clearly they just like me. 
because I mean, look at me, have you seen my face? Like this works, right? But like when I'm coding, oh my goodness, I'm an idiot. So I just assumed that was what it was. Um, and that sort of, that, that, that level of, of, I don't wanna call it fear, but like anxiety rather, can paralyze you, can be very debilitating. And it keeps you from wanting to try new things and it keeps you from wanting to take chances. And what ended up happening was the, the organization moved in a direction that I didn't agree with, something I didn't wanna do. I ended up working uh, with government clients, which I never saw myself doing. And I should have moved a year before I actually did, but that, that sort of feeling, that fear kept me there. Um, and it causes missed potential opportunities. So what that does, what that did for me at least was it kept me from interviewing. And by the time I was like, I can't take this anymore. I need to find something else to do. It had been four years since I had done a technical interview. And I didn't even realize, I was like, I don't even know what interviewing at my level looks like. I don't even know what level I'm at. Mid-career, what even is that? And so um, it just created this like big monster of me figuring out what I wanted to do. And I ended up being uh, reached out to by a former coworker who went and started his own business. Um, and he approached me about a job and I really wanted to take the job, but it was a risk, right? Small startup, you never heard of it before, that sort of thing. And I was like, well, you know, if I don't think I'm good at what I do, combined with the fact that I'm getting this offer, but if that doesn't work out, can I even make it back to Microsoft, you know, even if, because I kind of felt like I got here as a fluke. So, you know, it, it really, it, like it kills you. So what ended up happening, the way I got past it was, you know, you have to act past the fear. You got to acknowledge it, that it's a thing that you deal with, right? Uh, Maya Angelou calls this feeling the imposter police, um, to which I have a quote from her, by the way. Um, which is, I've written 11 books, but each time I think, oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody and they're going to find me out. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I wanted to take this role, but I had no idea what my market value was because it had been so long since I interviewed um, because I was afraid of rejection, I guess. I don't know. So um, my point is the longer you go in like inadvertently avoiding these things, the worse that monster becomes and it gets harder and harder to move. So um, the TLDR is to fake it till you make it because everybody else is. <laughs> um, and people feed for, off of your confidence, whether or not it is real, even if you feign that confidence, it's something that people feel and they feed off of it. Um, and if you need that extra boost in confidence, this helps you both professionally and uh, helps me internally uh, create content. Just make something, make something that you can put on your resume, make something that you can go back to and say, yeah, no, I've done stuff like this. I've done stuff in this vein, right? Whether it's content on a resume, whether it's a blog, whether it's a side project that you worked on that you can speak to, make that content that you always have. Because even when you're not confident, your papers, your accolades will speak for themselves. Um, and uh, so that's tip number one. Uh, Nina, I just saw you come off of video mute. Did you have something you wanted to, to, to say or? or uh... Okay, I just heard a little beep. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna keep on steamrolling. Um, and again, y'all feel free to interrupt. I like questions. <laughs> so that would be tip number one. Tip number two, especially early career folks, always have a plan. Um, if you don't plan your career, whether that be academic or professionally, um, whatever the powers are that be in your life will plan that out for you. So if you don't do it, they will, right? You should always have very ambitious goals, goals that feel like they're just out of reach that you know won't happen. I like the notion of short, medium, and long-term goals, where you start with the long-term goals. This is my five-year plan. This is what I want to be in five years. Um, and make sure that your short and medium-term goals serve that long-term goal um, to ensure that this actually happens, to ensure that this, this comes through for you. Make sure you've got the right resources in place to actually execute on that plan, right? Talk to a career coach, talk to you know, a student success operative at uh, Bentley University, of which I know there are plenty. Um, definitely uh, uh, use those resources in your back pocket um, because they stand to gain as much as you do from you know, your own career excelling, so it's great. Uh, up next, uh, <laughs> failure, failure is excellent experience. Um, it was so hard, it was really hard getting back out there and interviewing again and doing these technical interviews. For those that may not know, um, 
in software, when you're being vetted, the interview process is like notoriously grueling, right? Uh, technical interviews suck. You're coding on the spot. A lot of folks expect you to know these really archaic uh, algorithms that you may have read in a book, but in my case, you haven't seen in six years, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's a lot, but every time you go in and even if you bomb that interview, you've walked away with a little something, right? Every failure, every no, every rejection is, you know, you growing as a professional and as a person. Um, my favorite story here, this one is a uh, talk about Windows Phone. <laughs> so um, do y'all know that thing called Windows Phone? Have y'all heard of that? Is that a thing that existed for, for Gen Zers? Um, uh, <laughs> so once upon a time, Microsoft tried to make a phone and they were bad. Um, and uh, we realized that it was a chicken and the egg problem, right? Um, you can't have a phone out there with no apps and nobody's gonna make apps for a phone that nobody buys. So it's like, how do you solve this? And Microsoft's way to address this was, well, we'll just build in support for Android apps. And that project blew up in flames. I think it was called Project Centennial. And um, it just never worked. We couldn't get it working on Windows Phone or rather we could have, but by the time it was even in alpha stages, um, we had to pull that cord, uh, you know, Apple and I'm sorry, iOS and Android were too big at that point. So that kind of like hit the bricks. Uh, and that ended up, uh, all that work ended up rematerializing itself later in Microsoft's life as this uh, feature called WSL, which is Windows Subsystem for Linux. Android is just Linux at the end of the day. So Windows Subsystem for Linux allows folks like me to run Linux apps on Windows now. And so it has this huge cult following now, you know, it was repurposed into this new feature. And a step past that, it's sort of evolving this knowledge that we picked up from, w from Windows Subsystem for Linux and then from Windows Phone days is the ability to run Android apps on Windows natively now. So the new, uh, y'all may have heard of it, the new Windows update is gonna allow you to run Android apps from, I believe it's the Amazon app store um, on Windows. So you can you know, actually Snapchat from your laptop, which is great. Um, that would not have happened had it not been for that initial failure. Uh, another instance is the Connect, you know, that, that lovely uh, uh, thing that the camera on the Xbox that sort of um, cost us about six years of doom when we announced the Xbox One. Um, People stopped building games for it. People stopped buying it. People didn't really want it. But that research turned into two big products. Our AR VR headset, our mixed reality headset. Um, I keep saying our, like I'm still working at Microsoft. It's been two months, guys. I'm still getting used to it. Um, uh, the HoloLens was this is this really cool headset that allows you to interact with the real world using a lot of the sensors and a lot of the the research learned from building the connect in the first place and on the cloud side there's this device called the azure connect which i have around here somewhere um, that's a huge camera 4k camera with all these sensors attached to it eight different microphones to detect positional audio and they can be used in enterprise scenarios for things like um, object detection and person detection so that if someone's walking through a room to deliver a package, you can see who it was, if you've got facial recognition going, what time they came in, what the size of the box they're holding is, all of that came from the Connect. So failures almost always end up informing is what I wanted to, to, to throw in there from both a personal and from an enterprise perspective. And I also wanna talk about happiness in general. Um, and uh, And, I wanted to cover what happens if you're not happy. So I, by nature, am somebody who does not like to quit. If I don't like something, if things aren't working out for me, it takes a, re it takes a lot for me to say, okay, I have to let it go. Um, and sometimes that can be read as tenacity. Sometimes it can be read as stubbornness. Uh, so if you're not happy in your current major or in your current role or what you're doing right now, I would always ask yourself, is this temporary? Is, you know, the expected gain, like, what, what can I get from this? Like, take that step back and ask, is it worth what I'm doing right now, that end goal? Um, and if it is, oops, if it is worth it, um, you know, definitely stay, stick with it, get that experience and always ask for help. And if it's, if it's not uh, something I regret doing uh, when I was an undergrad, if it's not, fail fast, pull that ripcord, get out of there, um, uh, fail fast and pivot. I should not have stayed in chemistry for that extra year. Um, I would have had friends by the time I graduated 
Um, if I would have just switched my major early instead of taking 21 hours plus a part-time job. By the way, worked at Radio Shack, y'all. It was great. Uh, Radio Shack was a store. That <laughs> I'm, I'm done. But um, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was really rough goings. And if I would have just seen the pattern early and realized that this isn't what I wanted to do. Um, if I would have shadowed a professional in the field in at working as a pharmacist, I would have known that that wasn't for me. Um, I should have done that and uh, I regret it. And now I'm telling everybody about it so that y'all don't make the same mistake. Uh, and this is a quote from a book that uh, I read called The Pragmatic Programmer. Um, and this has to do with, uh, I like that they use organization because it's not just a workplace. It can also be a school. It can also be whatever community you're a part of. You can change your organization or change your organization. Meaning um, if, if you don't like what's happening right now, but you believe in it, you can change it for the better, you, where you're working, where you're going to school, what you're doing, the community you're a part of. And if that doesn't work, then you can just leave. You have that freedom. <laughs> and that's always an option. And so I wanted to call that out there. Um, up next is that uh, balance is everything. You're not gonna enjoy anything you're doing if you're always doing it. If you're giving your whole self to something and leaving time leaving no time for the other things in life that need to be attended to. And this is like a personal life, right? This could be personal relationships. It could be family, it could be whatever. Um, you can only grind for so long before it catches up with you. Um, engineering is hard. Anything worth having is hard, right? Anything in STEM is hard for sure. Um, but spending all your time working will make you hate your work. Uh, and I know that's a hard thing to say to students who are like, yeah, that's all fine and good, Gavin, but I've got a deadline now. <laughs> um, and the, the, the fact of the matter is that's true, that's real, but you have to eke out that time for yourself, even if you plan it ahead of time. Um, this was a quote uh, given to me by a friend, uh, you owe your success to a many, um, but no, not a single one owes you anything, uh, which I identified with so hard. Um, and that just um, helps maintain humility throughout your career. You know, remember that, you know, you didn't get where you are alone. Uh, I can guess that you didn't get to Bentley alone. That's already a huge achievement, by the way, in case you didn't feel like it was, because I know uh, going through school, you kind of end up cross-eyed, but congrats on getting there and congrats on sticking it out. Um, uh, but I can guess that not anyone in that room got there alone, right, from their own, uh, from their own doings, right? We all had help. You know, we all have family to support. We all have friends to support. We all have programs that have supported us. So uh, just remember that. Um, I, didn't, I couldn't find a good gift for this. So I just picked one up of, you know, uh, Richard Ayoade throwing a laptop, a computer screen. That just felt right. But uh, the best teacher is experience. What I mean from th by that is to listen to yourselves, listen to what works for you, uh, learn what works for you, learn how you work, learn how you're productive. Um, I am ADHD like you would not believe. Uh, silence does not work for me. Silent environments just don't work for me. Um, so I learned that. And when I'm studying, when I'm reading something, I literally have a backtrack that just sounds like Starbucks, just playing on in the background. That makes me feel like, oh, okay, yeah, no, there's activity happening. Um, the best way to learn that that's how you work is by taking chances and just jumping into stuff. Uh, the longer you wait, the more you'll regret you know, not having done that. And, you know, you'll be finding these things out later in life and going, oh, wow, well, I wish I could have gone back five years and done that. Um, up next is take risks within reason. So I work at a very early stage startup now, that one I was telling y'all about that I was, you know, super nervous about. Um, I ended up taking that job um, and I have a lead position there uh, building out the back end, but we are very early stage. Um, so this is a risk, right? I, you know, I left seemingly the comfort of Microsoft to come here. And uh, that's a big risk, especially for somebody who's been there his entire professional career. So like, why would you do it? Um, you know, why would you, why is this something you wanted? Um, and I wanna talk about like what led me there was primarily the fact that uh, I wanted to grow as an engineer. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to own more of the product. And when you work at these large tech companies, it is uh, very easy to be, uh, to, you get experience, to be clear, you'll get a ton of experience, but it's very easy to fall into this, this, this rabbit hole of being the subject matter expert of a very specific thing, because you know the products you're building are very large. And um, in order to uh, maintain everything, they have to have a lot of engineers. All these engineers need to take 
you know, small components of a very large feature set and own that to from beginning to end, right? Uh, the joke I make is, um, you know, hi, my name is Gavin. I own the right click menu, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, uh, that is, I'm joking obviously, but it can get extremely granular. And I wanted the experience owning a whole product. I wanted the experience building a product from beginning to end, testing it, making sure that it's right, making sure that it's um, resilient and then shipping it and seeing what fails, right? So I wasn't gonna get that where I was. And uh, I, I felt like I needed that experience to fill in a gap in my own resume. Um, so when offered the position, um, the, the financially the offer looked great. Uh, in tech, by the way, startup or no startup, your salary should be competitive. And I can say that in this case, it was, it was very competitive uh, and it sounded great. And the person I was working with, I happened to have had a working relationship with, but remember that it had been four years since Gavin had interviewed. So before I took that plunge, uh, that reason component came into play. I needed to make sure that my market value aligned with what I thought I was worth. So I took a bunch of interviews. And um, before I said yes to that job, I made sure that, okay, I'm in a position where my work experience is still relevant. I can still get offers. Um, so professionally speaking, that was what I did. I made sure to interview. I did it over two months. I walked out with uh, about five offers. Felt real good about that, by the way, y'all. Five offers in two months, but um, um, I got a lot of rejections to be clear. Um, the meanest one was Netflix. They didn't have to say what they said. Um, we don't think your experience aligns with what we're looking for. Well, I don't think that my subscription aligns with my wallet anymore. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I still have a Netflix subscription. But my, my point is, um, you know, uh, I made sure that, hey, if this doesn't work out, if there's no more runway, and I did ask about that, I asked, well, what's the runway? If you're, if you're thinking about going startup, you have to understand, okay, well, if this all goes belly up, how long do we have? Um, and um, for us, it was a few years. I was like, okay, I can do that when I took the plunge. So I wanted to call that out. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple minutes uh, before we have to wrap it up. Couple minutes. All right, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, so some concrete go-dos you can do today. So that was like the all lofty stuff, the oh my goodness, my heart stuff. But this is, this is some things that y'all can do right now to enhance yourselves professionally. The first is uh, join that community, take advantage of them, do it with friends if it helps, but don't wait on your friends, all right? So do that. Up next, obsess over your resume and get people to review your resume. Draft, redraft, peer review, and shoot your resume to anybody who will listen. Um, I, I walk my talk. So if you want somebody who's been in industry to look at a resume, feel free to send me an email or send me a message on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm happy to review resume and provide feedback. Um, and if you don't feel like you have enough on your resume just yet, um, take, a, take a course, go to Udacity, go to take a multi- so, I'm sorry, a MOOC is what it's called, a massively online open courseware. Take one of those and that's something to put on your resume really quickly. Uh, work on projects. It does not have to be official. If you're really into data and you're not so much into, you know, the code side of things, build a data-based project. Find a correlation between COVID and the amount of Little Debbie snacks that Gavin's eaten. Um, something like that. Uh, if you're a freshman, internships are everything. That resume I told you about, get that going. Draft that right now, right? And go to like, go to the, the, the Fortune 500 list, start at number one and just submit for all the way down. Just submit it to everybody. Somebody will get back to you. Um, know your value and how to create value. Understand what your goals are. Know who the key players are and what they need. That way you can learn how to provide for, for them, right? So understand that, you know, hey, it is in the interest of Bentley University that you end up with an internship because they can say that, hey, our students end up here at these companies, right? So understand that it is in the best interest of the people, the community you're in to do well. And that's how you consult them to help you do well. Uh, get a mentor in whatever field you're in, get a mentor. Yesterday, they will have walked that walk, they will have talked that talk. And um, even if you feel like you don't know what to ask them, ask them for 30 minutes um, and you'll figure something out. I promise that. Uh, uh, these are some books I like. I'm happy to share these out. Pragmatic Programmer, Cracking the Coding Interview. Uh, the, those two are very technical for like CS or CIS majors, right? 
Uh, the other two, the bottom two are for literally anyone. The Lean Startup is a really, really good book and the Effective Executive are really, really good books to help you understand how you can provide value to the greater business. Um, I think those are great books. Um, I'm so sorry if I went too long. It's been a while since I did a talk like this. <laughs> but um, if we do have a couple minutes still left, Mark, I'm happy to take questions. If not, feel free to shoot your questions out to me. Um, uh, at Twitter or on LinkedIn. And um, while we're doing this, I'm going to do this live really quickly. I'll just drop my, uh, I'll just drop my email, which is just Gavin at uh, stately.ai. So I will, I will pop that in there. Gavin at stately.ai. And I will sh start this. I'll start from this current slide. So y'all can see right there. That's me. Sorry for the ramble. <laughs> Comments, questions, thoughts for Gavin before uh, I wrap this up here. Why don't you ask them some questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Oh, so uh, quite, wow, I didn't think right, about I'll questions. Ask question. Yes, ask ask me a question, Mark, and that'll give me time. <laughs> so I'm curious, you guys were here. What's your one take home message from what Gavin talked about? One thing. If you had to make a bumper sticker about this session, what would you put on it? Always add gifts to PowerPoint <laughs> slides. I would say explore, not like take the first thing, just explore majors and stuff, actually. Good. That's pretty helpful. Love that. Mm. Love that. Take a shotgun approach. Yeah, just, just try anything. You never know what you're going to like. Uh, and you'll never know, like, the people that you meet. Um, you know, they may come back and, and have that next thing for you that really excites you. 